Uh, this session is a continuation of the interview with Ralph Wagner Woolard, a highly decorated veteran of the European Theater of World War II. The first interview took place on July 19, 2007. Today is July 30, 2007, and we are in the WILL television studio in Campbell Hall at the University of Illinois in Urbana, Illinois. My name is Harriet Williamson. I am a producer with WILL Radio. Also in the studio is Mr. Willard's wife, Wilma Lee Broughton Willard, and Julius Bolton, who's director of lighting, sound, and camera. Uh, in the last two sessions on July 19th, Mr. Willard told us about his background, how he became a soldier in the U.S. Army, his training, his transport to Africa, and descriptions of several major battles, uh, for example, Monte Cassino and Anzio. At the end of the last session, Mr. Willard had taken us through Rome to the town of Megliano, where he was in another battle and subsequently suffered multi-wounds, followed by surgery in Naples with a four-week recovery period and sent to a reconditioning camp. Um, does this take us through uh, July 1944? Am I correct in the date, or do I have that? June 14th was the date of the injury, okay. and then uh, I joined the uh, my outfit in August, toward the end of August. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Woolard, could you please identify your rank in uh, Army Company and Unit and uh, continue your story? Yes, I, <clears throat> my rank at the end of the war and for a couple of months bef before the end was Staff Sergeant. I eventually became a, a squad leader of the uh, intelligence squad. Uh, prior to that, uh, all through the Italian campaign, I had the rank of corporal, which is really an assistant to the squad squad leader. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I was in Naples uh, at a hospital, which was really a tent hospital, and uh, had, I thought, very good care from uh, nurses, doctors, the entire staff, and um, a friend of mine who had been wounded at the same time I was wounded. His name was Waylon P. Dulles. He lives in. He was one of the original members of the 36th Division. A uh, very slightly built fellow, with uh, some college behind him and a tremendous sense of humor. At uh, he liked Vino pretty well. Um, he was wounded in the knee, and uh, he was sent back to his outfit, to our outfit, before I was. But uh, in a march that they had to make, <clears throat> his knee uh, got to swelling again, and it was about the size of a large grapefruit. and. Uh, the unit sent him back to the hospital. <clears throat> there were several hospitals in the general area where uh, I was located, and he was to go to another hospital, but everyone had to fun funnel themselves through a admissions officer and then off to a, whatever hospital they were to get the best treatment in. Uh, Dawes, uh, failed to go to the admissions unit. He had been drinking a bit of vino, and uh, he was a happy-go-lucky fellow. He, his intent was to look me up, and which he did. He found me, and, and uh, I was not supposed to get out of bed by doctor's orders, but uh, I knew that Dawes should be over at the admission office. I uh, said, Dawes, come with me, we'll go over. I got some crutches and took him over there. The, uh, he was happy all the way. And we met the admissions officer. Uh, the admissions officer has said, roll up your pant leg. He did so. Of course, it was a huge knee. And the admission officer says, soldier, just what is it you can't do with that knee? Dawes looked at him for some time and he said, Sir, I can't play the piano with it. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't 
set very well with the admissions officer, but <laughs> nevertheless, Dawes got in and he uh, had an entry that never allowed him to come back to the 36th mm -hmm. Infantry Division, which I was in all through the war. I think uh, toward the end of August, uh, they said that uh, I should go to a reconditioning camp, which was uh, 10 or 15 miles north of Naples. It was a small village just on the uh, coastline of the Mediterranean. I, uh, we took uh, daily swims in the Mediterranean. We walked uh, or hiked around a mountain and uh, d did some running. Uh, for almost a week. The uh, interesting thing about that location was that it was called Lake Averno. It was an old volcano. The mountain itself was a uh, volcano at one time, but had been filled in with water. Mm -hmm. Beautiful place. It and, and the Virgil's Iliad, it was the entrance to hell. And the, uh, as the story goes. And uh, sometime I'd like to go back, but uh, haven't made so yet. Uh, at the end of that period, the reconditioning camp, uh, I was to rejoin my outfit. Now the uh, 36th Division had been pulled off the Italian front and was uh, now, uh, in France, they had uh, led the invasion to southern France and uh, up the Rhone Valley, and I was to join them in southern France. The division had, or in uh, wherever they were when I could catch up with them, the uh, division had uh, a rather easy time of it, comparatively speaking, in going into southern France. It was nothing like Normandy and northern France. But uh, there were uh, men who were lost. I think the most serious wound that anyone in my squad uh, had was a little, a little finger which was, bent, which was uh, cut and uh, was crooked for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, the uh, fighting uh, at the... Uh, once a bridgehead had been uh, developed, a beachhead had been developed, then the Germans uh, retreated uh, uh, very rapidly. They knew that they couldn't fight on so many fronts. They had to pull their lines together. Matters of supply were critical. And uh, so uh, the German troops uh, vacated much of southern France up through the Rhone Valley and we in pursuit of them. Um, every once in a while they would stop and uh, fight a delaying action mm -hmm. and uh, it took a couple of weeks for us to get up to a point where they really were determined to make a stand. It, uh, in, in that time uh, we had a a few days off, uh, maybe from the line, we'd, they'd pull us out for a couple of days and uh, then we'd go back in. Uh, it was not, at that particular time, it was not quite as intense as the fighting in, in Italy. But um, there are some scenarios that uh, might be of interest here. Um, the, every once in a while, you see some things that uh, you won't see in any place other than in actual warfare. For instance, uh, we, were at we attacked one village, French village, and uh, we, the Germans were moved out. And I was rummaging around in a house uh, 
what I was really trying to find was some chicory. <laughs> now, I knew that the French were using chicory rather than coffee. They couldn't get it. And we were out of coffee, and I was trying to find in this house some chicory, which I didn't find. But uh, all of a sudden, I heard uh, a lot of commotion. I looked out the window, and here a group of Frenchmen. I'm assuming that they were members of the French forces of the interior, which was a, a small group of uh, French patriots who uh, occasionally or uh, act to disrupt German movements that mm -hmm. sabotage a train or um, shoot up some Germans, which if they thought they could. But looking across the street, this was into a kind of a municipal building and there was a public square. There were 18 or 19 uh, Frenchmen and one girl. She uh, was a woman of about 19, uh, 20 years, I should say. And uh, I called uh, my um, one of the squad members who spoke French, and I said, what are they doing over here? And they're yelling, and, and he said, uh, well, they're accusing her of fraternizing mm -hmm. with the Germans. She had a German boyfriend. And they took out some scissors and some shears, mm -hmm. and they cut off all of her hair, and uh, then told her that she was to leave the community. That pointed in the direction, mm -hmm. and uh, they, they got down to the bare skin and the uh, and her hair. This was not uh, the same every place. It was duplicated in a lot of different towns, and sometimes it was more, uh, they would strip the, uh, strip the woman of all of her clothing, shave mm -hmm. her hair, and uh, send them out of town. Uh, so that was the first time you had seen that? Uh, that uh, was in uh, northeastern France, mm -hmm. and uh, that was, it it said, it uh, it bothered me, frankly. Mm -hmm. I thought uh, to myself, I that you fellows probably uh, never did too much to oppose the Germans, in mm -hmm. in my estimation, they occasionally would get something done, but uh, here they were picking on this woman, but. There are things like that you can't control. We mm -hmm. well, that was out of our jurisdiction, and uh, we had to move on. At another point, <clears throat> I think I might have told you uh, there were two fellows in my squad who could speak German. One, <clears throat> well, a young man from Chicago, whose parents had been killed in a German concentration camp. He was uh, uh, gotten out of Europe, out of Germany, by an uncle who lived in Chicago who was able to manage some way of getting him uh, back, uh, or getting him to Chicago at the age of 14. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> he was a very bright fellow, a Jewish fellow. And uh, he uh, had an intense feeling about the Germ Germans. And you can understand it. We, of course, part of our job was uh, uh, working with prisoners, taking prisoner when we could, interrogating them. And of course, uh, this young man had to take a good active part in that. You know, with such questions as what uh, what division are you in uh, would pose this to the uh, soldiers. What kind of uh, armaments uh, do you have directly facing this sector? Uh, how about tanks? We hear uh, we hear tank movement at night. We know there are tanks there. How many do you have? Well. Some Germans would talk and some wouldn't. 
and you had to ascertain them from those who would talk whether they were telling you the truth. And uh, but I recall one incident uh, very well. This is in north northern France again. It was a <clears throat> we had a, an officer, a, Ger a German officer. He was uh, rather smartly dressed. His clothing was in good shape, and uh, but he was arrogant as the Dickens. And uh, he told us in no uncertain term that uh, we would never beat Germany. That this was, you may advance a bit, but uh, you'll have to go through the Siegfried line and there's no way you can get through it. Um, my interpreter, the, the uh, young man, uh, took exception to this fellow's uh, demeanor, and he uh, looked him up and down, and he noticed a ring on his finger. He said, uh, give me that ring. The uh, officer said, no, he would not. Uh, Again, the command was repeated, give me that ring. And he said he would not, it was a it was an heirloom from the family. It was his and he was going to keep it. He had that right. Uh, now I was uh, in charge of the squad at that time and I wasn't gonna let anything happen that uh, shouldn't happen, but I could see that uh, uh, this young man of, uh, was demanding the ring, that uh, he was extremely angry and uh, he made a move to take his bayonet out. And uh, he said, now give me the ring. But the officer took it off and threw it in the ground. And uh, it was repeated, give me the ring. You stoop over and get it, which he did. And he handed it to uh, the interpreter. Which, and he took it and threw it as far as he could throw it. Just, he didn't want the ring. He just wanted to put this soldier, this officer who was so arrogant, uh, in his place. And uh, those things happen. The same, uh, not far away from here, and uh, within a couple of days of that event, uh, we were in another battle, this time with SS troops. Perhaps you've heard of the expression, the SS troops were the elite of the German army. They were, uh, um, their, their uh, feeling for Hitler, uh, yeah, he was almost a god for them. And, uh, but we had uh, defeated them in this battle and uh, there were always some wounded that they, uh, have to be taken care of, both German and our own. And there was an SS trooper on the ground, and our aid man was giving him transfusion, or uh, um, blood supply. Mm. Now, <clears throat> this young man I was telling you about, the, our interpreter, who is Jewish, as I said, leaned over to this SS trooper and says, that's Jewish blood you're getting. The uh, SS trooper said, Nick's Hobbin, Nick Hobbin. He tried to pull this out of his arm. Fortunately, the aid man and another fellow were there to stop him. Mm -hmm. But uh, those are the kind of things that happen. Of course, <clears throat> there are moments when things are a little lighter. We uh, 
in that same area in France. Mickey Rooney, the actor and comedian, came in and gave a... Uh, we were back off the line for a day or two, and he and gave a program. He was quite, quite humorous, funny. Uh, and then, for some reason, we were, uh, my squad was eating. We had some, some of the canned rations. And Rooney pulled over. He was, had a Jeep. That somebody he had a driver, of course, but he saw us eating. He pulled over, and he said, "I'm hungry," and uh, so he ate with our squad. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, of course, was on stage most of the time. He was uh, he was quite a jokester. And uh, after eating, he moved on. And uh, but it was a lighter moment that you. Or Did that enjoy. help, do you think, with the morale? Did it help? Mm -hmm. Or, or uh, not? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I think it did. Uh, there were others, of course, who uh, entertained. But uh, it was a diversion, mm -hmm. and uh, you appreciated any diversion. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, there were some visitors that we, uh, and this seems strange, but the uh, Red Cross girls. They were uh, active, and uh, they would uh, come to your unit and uh, banter with you a little bit. And of course, this was out of artillery range. I never cared to see them come because they always brought donuts. And if you got donuts, you know you were going right back up on the line. <laughs> so I much preferred not to see them. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but uh, they, they were, I think, uh, much better help and aid to uh, what we called rear echelon troops, troops who were and in, uh, in the back. <clears throat> um, as we moved up uh, closer to Germany, we approached this area that is known as, uh, well, uh, the Ardennes Forest and the Vosges area. The Ardennes Forest is a a uh, beautiful stretch of uh, huge trees. And uh, we ran into also the wine country uh, very close to it. Um, we were in a, this is another, another battle, and it was a very, right to, uh, right within the uh, wine area of uh, France. And uh, there were several little cities, little uh, villages that uh, were important in the wine industry. But I recall uh, one of them, and we again were, uh, had uh, been in a battle for this little town, and there was, uh, still some fighting going on, but the fighting at that point was between tanks. There was a tank battle. And uh, <clears throat> we were in a house and uh, kind of trying to protect ourselves from any stray artillery shells. And there was a woman in there in the house. And she was, we found out, very close to 90 years of age. I think she was 88. And uh, she could speak uh, French and uh, German both, as, as most people in the wine country could. She uh, said that uh, this was the third war that she had seen from this house. She'd lived in this house all of her life. 
the Franco-Prussian War of 1872, World War I, 1914 to 18. And here she was in the 1940s witnessing Goodness. the Third War. And she had escaped injury on all of them. So he must have felt a special need to protect her. Yes. Well, she, uh, uh, we had a young man in our, our squad who was, uh, had movie star qualities. He was a good-looking young fellow. And uh, he had been in a rifle company uh, originally and had done some rather heroic things. And uh, was uh, we needed, uh, he could also speak French, and he was transferred to our intelligence unit. So uh, this old woman took a shine to him, and she had quite a sense of humor, and she said um, she offered to marry him <laughs> if, he, if he would take her to the United States and they could start life all over again. <laughs> she was a very amu amusing woman with a good, a good spirit. Do you think she survived the war? I suspect she did, mm -hmm. because it very quickly moved on from there. And uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm sure she had probably relatives somewhere. Um, We, uh, we were in the wine country, and we were rather certain that we were going to have a uh, big battle for a town called Celestat. And it's right in the middle of a wine, wine country, and... Uh, the question, question was, what kind of armaments were down in that town? And uh, how are we going to find out what they are? We could do uh, flyovers and so on. But we knew that this was a big rail center and that uh, supplies for all the German troops in a broad area and they were brought into town by train. We knew that from aerial, from aerial observation. So uh, my squad got the, I, sh I say, honor. Uh, it was more of a, a, a real challenge to go to infiltrate the line and determine what was going on in Celestat. Uh, <clears throat> Celestat was uh, oh, close to 15 miles from where our general line was. And uh, between where we were and Celestat, it was heavily forested, either heavily forested or uh, vineyards. And um, uh, the best chance of going un undetected was through the forest. So uh, we took a reinforced squad. We had a couple of uh, three fellows from one of the other uh, squads in the uh, headquarters company. And uh, then uh, a sergeant from the uh, Pioneer section. So uh, the challenge was to get through the mountains, to get to a point where we could observe what was going on in town. And uh, we started one night and uh, through the forest and we got through the German line, the front line. Okay, we uh, were marching at night 
We saw only one person. This was a Frenchman. This was about 11 o'clock at night. And uh, I don't know what he was doing out of his house, but uh, uh, we uh, talked to him and uh, asked him if he had seen any German soldiers in the area. He had not, he said. We weren't quite certain <coughs> about uh, about him because there were some divided loyalties in that area of Alsace-Lorraine. Some people had German sympathies, others, most of them were uh, French, were uh, sympathetic to the French. But you never knew. The question was, what are we going to do with this fellow? You know, and some wanted to do away with him. Some uh, wanted to take him with us. In the end, uh, we talked to him uh, and told him that uh, we're going to let him go. But uh, if things didn't work out as we wanted, we would be back. You know. So we uh, got 12, 12 miles, at the best estimate, mm. uh, behind the German lines. And uh, we found a uh, hotel and restaurant, beautiful place up on this mountainside. And, uh, and when morning came, we could look down the valley and see the city of Silistat. Now this town is a city probably of uh, 20,000 people, something like that. We also had an artillery observer with us. I didn't mention this. He's a fellow who is, uh, really belongs to the artillery division, but uh, he's a forward observer. And he would often be with my squad because he, uh, we would try to occupy a place where we could see a lot. And uh, he could uh, call for artillery fire from our positions. So he, uh, uh, he, he was with us. And uh, with the coming of light, uh, we saw no Germans, and uh, uh, that is in our immediate area. We uh, had the artillery observer look down into the city, and uh, he said, I think we're too far away from our own artillery, but I'm going to try to lob some shells into the city. Oh my goodness. And uh, he did that, uh, but they would fall about uh, you know, half mile short or a mile short. And uh, so <clears throat> that was uh, useless. But what we did observe was the trains coming into town and uh, with all kinds of armaments and ammunition, food, etc. Mm. And uh, reinforcing uh, the troops in the in this town and in the general area. Now we, we remained up there another night, uh, and as night fell, about eight o'clock in the evening, uh, we had, as yet no one knew we were there, except uh, our own troops. Uh, we, we heard a car. Well, we thought it was a car, and it was coming up a road to this hotel. And uh, we knew that uh, this would be German, very likely. And uh, so we surrounded the par parking area in some bushes and just waited. And this car came roaring up, and two officers got out. One of them was a uh, Lutheran minister uh, who was a part of the German army. You know, there was some misunderstanding about the role of the Lutheran church in uh, the uh, war in Germany. Some of the Lutheran ministers would not uh, put up with Hitler at all and were killed 
or escaped. Uh, some uh, decided that they would go along and try to help where they could. So uh, the other the other officer was a regular infantry officer, but they came up to this hotel thinking that they could get something to eat, something uh, to eat and drink, not knowing that we were up there. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I failed to mention that the owners of the hotel uh, were there when we got there, and they uh, we had them locked up in a room. So uh, uh, we had to interrogate those prisoners, and uh, we put them in the hotel and locked them in a room and uh, put a guard over it. And then by the next day, uh, our uh, division had gathered enough steam that it had moved forward 12, 13 miles, and we rejoined them. Mm -hmm. Now, when you rejoined them, did they come up to this hotel? Uh, yes, they did. And, and uh, had they encountered any fighting on their way up? Uh, originally, they, they did. And, uh, but uh, as the Germans quickly realized it was a formidable force, mm -hmm. and they knew that in order to fight it, that they would have to get back to Celestat, mm -hmm. because the, uh, uh, they had fortifications, and uh, they could do house-to-house -house fighting. It was uh, once our troops got in position close, uh, close to Celestat, and then uh, went into the city, it was a terrible battle. It was a, a, a frightful battle. And uh, then we uh, pushed the Germans out of town, but the next day they counterattacked, and uh, again, a very uh, heavily fought battle. And, uh, but eventually uh, we, uh, <clears throat> we won and uh, pushed the Germans on out. We received a compliment from the German general who was which commanded the troops there, he said. Uh, at the uh, end of the first battle, he turned to his troops, or said to his troops, we're going back in and we want you to fight as well as members of this 36th Division fought. Mm -hmm. So they respected the, our, our division. What made it so frightful? Was it because it, it was hand-to-hand -hand or house-to-house? Uh, it, house? it was both. Uh, it was both. It was just house-to-house, uh, house-to-house. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had tanks, uh, and they had uh, anti-tank uh, guns. Uh, tr uh, probably the best weapon in the war was their, was their German 88-millimeter uh, anti-tank gun. It was a tremendous weapon. What was it that made it such a great weapon? Was it, it was, uh, it was uh, uh, muzzle velocity where the shell uh, moves through the, the barrel and comes out uh, at such a high speed that uh, you, know, you could shoot flat trajectory for uh, a long, long period. That is, uh, without dropping uh, to the ground, it just would keep co going. Mm -hmm. And uh, it also had high penetrating power. Uh, it was so pitiful in North and North Africa. And we had tanks that were uh, 57 millimeter, which uh, they would not penetrate the German tank even. Mm -hmm. And uh, But this was a very, very fine uh, weapon. 
Were there civilians also still living in this town? Uh, there were a few, a few, but not many. Mm -hmm. Most of them would scatter out. I recall uh, we took a prisoner in Salastat at uh, one of the, I've forgotten whether it was first or second battle, but uh, he was a young man about our age. And uh, he, we had been fighting all day, just house to house. And uh, he was uh, just sick of the war. He was tired, and uh, we were we were tired. And I had uh, one of our German-speaking interpreters say, "Tell him we're tired. We're in this house." We're going to sleep for a little while. Now, you're going to get over in that corner and you turn your back to the rest of us. And if you make one move to get up or move around, it'd be your last. You know, that's just put in the strongest terms we could. He says, don't worry about me. He said, I'm sick of it. And <laughs> he lay down and went to sleep. <laughs> that was a... One of those, one of those moments. But it it was uh, a terrific battle. We uh, we were in the wine country. If you ever have a chance to go, you should go. It's just beautiful. Uh, I we were in a little town called Ribovilla. Today, if you go there, you know, uh, it's a very expensive town to, to visit. But Ribo Valais was perhaps 10,000 people. And uh, I was, uh, by this time, uh, head of the squad. But uh, our uh, company command commander wanted us to go out uh, at night on a point uh, that uh, would be close to German lines. Uh, he wasn't quite sure where the German lines were, and neither were we, but um, we went out about 10 o'clock at night to uh, do some vineyards and uh, to a point where we thought would maybe be a good observation point. And uh, we dug some holes. We had a new man with us. And uh, he was an extremely nervous fellow. And uh, I did what my first, uh, my... Uh, Sergeant did for me when I first joined the company. I said, you come and get in with me. So we, we had a hole we dug together. and uh, But all this time we were listening. And uh, we knew that we were within 40 or 50 feet of German troops. We could, I knew enough German by this time that even I could, uh, could tell it. And... Uh, they were talking, and uh, eventually they heard us there. But uh, the young man I was with, would uh, he wanted to smoke. And uh, I said, you're not to smoke. You would give your position away. You can't light a cigarette without a flare of some sort. Well... Uh, I had to get up out of the hole. Uh, one of the men wanted something, and uh, we really were trying to s decide what our next steps would be. But when I got back to the hole with this young fellow, he was smoking. And I said, uh, you know, I've told you, you're making a target out of yourself and all the rest of us. So I said, uh, I'm going to have my own hole 
and uh, you may have dug your last. Well, I started to walk away to find a different place to dig in, and at that time a shell landed, and uh, I got my second uh, wound that evening. Uh, it was a wound to the chest and uh, bicep on the left left arm. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> the only thing to do, uh, I had to walk back to the company. Uh, well, the company uh, headquarters was in town, and uh, go to an aid station, uh, which was close, uh, close to the headquarters company. So. <clears throat> I got in town and uh, found the aid station, got some temporary uh, patching up, and they put me in a in a house with a room or two in it. And uh, there were a couple of other wounded fellows in there. And uh, then uh, the German Germans were quite active in that area. And they were they had sent troops in on a patrol, came into town, and were shooting. You know, it, you know it's German troops because of the sound of the weapon, and uh, they sounded like they were going to come down the street where where I was, mm -hmm. and I, I know I I sat up all night with my own weapon, uh, just thinking that they might mm -hmm. might come in. But uh, then uh, the next morning, uh, I was sent back. Now this was on uh, October. Uh, I'm sorry, December, December seventeenth, and the Battle of the Bulge was going on up in northwestern France, and. Uh, we knew that it was going on, and uh, we heard radio reports occasionally uh, on it. But I was sent back to a chateau, beautiful French chateau, uh, for treatment. And uh, this was uh, the night before Christmas. We had some entertainment at this chateau. That Catherine Cornell, a great actress, and uh, a British uh, gentleman. I since have forgotten his name. Uh, but they put on the play, The Barretts of Wimple Street, mm. which was uh, this chateau had its own theater, oh my God. stage, lovely place, and then some of the. Actors came around and and uh, talked to the uh, wounded. Uh, the next day, I was sent to southern France for uh, further treatment there. This was near Nice, a uh, lovely, lovely area. We were put into an old uh, TB sanitarium. It was a very nice place. Mm -hmm. With, uh, got very good care there, and uh, I was there. <clears throat> I was trying to recall just when I did. Uh, at the end of, it was toward the end of January, that I got back to with my troops again. So you had about a month break. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened to? Did you catch up then with the men who you were with when you were wounded? Yes. And I was did. the person who was in that foxhole who I never had saw him again. I don't know what happened to him. He uh, he hadn't been with us very long. And uh, I I found that my squad uh, and all through the war you know, it changed quite a bit. Mm -hmm. There were there was no one in it at the end who was in it at the beginning. Mm. So either uh, wounds or, or killed, 
our intelligence officer was killed, the first one in Italy, the second one, a Captain Knox, a very fine man, killed by sniper fire. Uh, he stepped out in front of a, uh, he was just looking around, stepped out in front of a, a tank and a sniper got him. Uh, how how many men would a be average in your squad? Well, ideally we were 12, but usually there were six, seven, and eight mm -hmm. right in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, uh, uh, the attrition was such that you always had a few who were had been with you a few mm -hmm. months, mm -hmm. and they were a very interesting group of, of men, I must say. Uh, all of them were good, intelligent fellows, but some most unlikely uh, to be in the Army. You, there was one of them who was 39 years old, and he's blind in one eye. Mm. And, yeah. and that was not a war wound? No. Mm. No, he was blind when they took him in. Mm. And he could never understand how he got it. He had to lean way over to sight his rifle. And, uh, but they were needing men, and uh, that's what, what happens, I'm afraid. Now, you were very young. You were... 20 years old. Yeah, I was, well, I was, right? I was, uh, yes, I was. Okay, 20. but and you were leading the squad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, at, uh, toward the end of the war, and uh, one of the Jewish boys was uh, probably 30, and uh, he died just recently. I used to go visit him in Florida. Uh, one fellow was uh, 39, uh, a couple were 25, so on. Uh, <clears throat> Neuberger, the uh, boy whose folks were killed in the concentration camp, he was 20 also. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was... Uh, <clears throat> They were fine soldiers. At the end of the war, we still had to act as soldiers, but they didn't like being a soldier at that time. They were, became a little bit difficult to, to, uh, to uh, work with. And uh, uh, first sergeant uh, had to reprimand a couple of them for their behavior. But they were good soldiers at the time. They needed to be soldiers. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> we, uh, after, after uh, Rebo Valais, uh, we moved rather quickly on into Germany. And uh, we, <clears throat> And in, in moving into Germany, we found some things that uh, were most unpleasant. Well, first of all, to get into Germany, we had to go through the Siegfried Line. And uh, the Siegfried Line had been uh, compared with what was the French Maginot Line, uh, which they felt was impenetrable. But... Uh, the Germans felt that their Siegfried line was really a, a steel ring and no one could go through. Well, it really consisted of all kinds of tank traps, which were huge concrete pieces that tanks could not get over. Uh, and then they had bunkers. These uh, bunkers were built into the sides of the hills and uh, camouflage. The walls were three feet thick, and uh, 
there were there was vegetation on top of them. Mm -hmm. They had uh, slits in the concrete so that the Germans could fire out through those slits. And uh, then uh, uh, in the forested areas, they had uh, cut all the trees down in front of these bunkers. Cut them down so that uh, anyone approaching the bunker would be seen. And uh, they had those in a ring, a very tight ring around the German border. Uh, how many miles did the Siegfried ha line, how, how long was that? How long was it? Mm -hmm. uh, You're changing tape? Okay.